Presenting for Team Saba and Saki is Audrey S. Darko, who comes to us from Ashisi University in Ghana. Audrey, join us up here. You've been waiting super patiently. You all set to go? Yes. All right, good luck. All right. Great. It's a great time to be here. I love to stay. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Audrey S. Darko. Over the journey, uh, Sabin Sake has had, we've been able to find a treasure trove of ideas from pivoting, iteration, et cetera, over our business concept. And we realized how it's so important to heavily skew towards um, a circular economy, and that should be the way forward, especially for developing countries like my Ghana. So I would just briefly want to give a big shout out to my teammates in Ghana. Unfortunately, I'm the only one here to represent, but they're watching me live. And hi, guys. Um, we're a great team, a multidisciplinary team, um, who have taken upon themselves to make this an applied project. And we are too excited because Right after, we are, we are planning to have, make this our sustainable agribusiness company right after we complete school. So I would like to give you a brief background about what inspired us. Well, with the huge excitement that accompanied the inauguration of a sugarcane factory in Ghana in 2010, I then began to understand what it meant for farmers like my grand uncle and a lot of those that I'm related to what it meant to them as I experienced going to the sugarcane plantations and the vast lands of, of farms that they had. However, this excitement was short-lived because there was a collapse, there was a resuscitation, and there was a collapse again of the sugarcane factory. And this inspired us to probe deeper into how best we can create a circular economy in this stead. So therefore, I would like to quickly introduce Sabin Sake, and what we do is to create biocompost fertilizer, as well as employ um, web-based technology to, in order to create a connection between the markets and then the farmers. Great, so before that, I would like us to have a quick snippet of the video um, that shows what exactly the problem is. Because for us, um, sugarcane waste has more to offer the world than what it currently does. And that is the major problem happening on the sugarcane farms. So over here, you can quickly see the gas in excess. And these are just one of the many farms um, across Ghana. So this is bagasse and uh, lots of farmlands and so on. So I would like to pause the video. But then in a nutshell, in a nutshell, the con it just gives us a snippet into the wider problem over here. So in the world, Averagely, 250 million tons of bagasse is being produced, right? And over a billion ton of sugarcane is produced yearly. But with our pilot project happening in the South Tongu district, Tave, the Volta region of Ghana currently, there are lots of problems that happen. There's little to no use of fertilizer by farmers. Well, in sub-Saharan Africa, where Ghana is 1%, is fertilizer used 2 to 3% for Africa um, all across the board. And the 64% of required sugarcane raw harvest for its sugar processing factories um, have collapsed. And currently, there's 750,000 tons averagely of bagasse being produced in Ghana. And just to show you what the linear economy is currently, in the video, there are mass, there's mass burning of all these tons of bagasse across the 192 cane districts. Um, over the 200, total 216 districts in Ghana. So this is what's happening across Ghana, and it's being replicated in other developing economies across board, Kenya, et cetera. Not to talk about the GHG emissions that are over 60% across board, 2,406 kilograms um, per cultivated sugar cane. So basically what we realized was there's a problem um, there are two major problems that we identified based on ethnographic research, observation, et cetera, and that was low crop yield and inaccessible markets. To give you a nutshell of that, currently there are only 700 rural fertilizer agents for um, an excess of 200,000 rural cane farmers, not to talk of other farmers. How does that match up? How can they have access um, and availability of fertilizer in order to increase crop yield and be able to sustain sugarcane factories that collapse because there's no um, supply. 
inaccessible market. So the valuable resource lost here is Bagasse, and this is land that is being burnt, and this was just about to be burnt when we went there to visit. And that's the linear economy there. So simply, I would like to talk about our, the inaccessible market and how our solution also solves that. We are working on a web-based technology, simply a website, focusing on cooperative farmers. Currently, we have one that is the Tove Corporate Farmers that um, would use the website and have connections um, um, with the market such that before um, the sugarcane waste is going to be lost, they can, they can allow, they can let the uh, markets know about it, and that would solve the 60% post-harvest loss of sugar cane that's happening in Ghana. So rescuing food, we feel this is an integral part of the circular economy, which should be looked at, and that is our phase two after we pr um, finish producing our fertilizer. This is a demo of it. Okay, so I'll quickly talk about our biocompost fertilizer. Currently, it's a combination of two methods, simply vermicomposting and microbiology. So vermicomposting uses earthen worms, and African earthen worms to be precise, and this is indigenous to Africans. What we do is to multiply them in our vermi hatcheries, right? And then they would, ha with their excellent burying properties, decompose the waste. Bioinoculated bagasse is just make multiplying strings of um, living, natural living organisms, which we currently are, um, are confining and multiplying in the Soil Research Institute of Ghana. So this, plus the vermicomposting, creates a Sabon Saki fertilizer, simply. And it's in a structure that basically employs a modified shipping container, as well as solar panels, et cetera. Probably would see that um, as we go across. So creating the circular economy is making use of this bagasse, um, bioinoculating it in powdered form using natural living organisms, making use of our vermicomposting, ethane worms being multiplied. That decomposes the time to 21 days as compared to three months and over for traditional natural um, composting. And that can help us sustain the factories in the long term. So this is a summary of a biocompass unit um, structure and how it works. So I'll quickly go into our progress so far. We've been able to secure land for our pilot project in the Tobi district of Ghana. And we've been able to secure 3,750 tons of bagasse, which enables us to produce about 27,550 kg fertilizer bags. And also concrete relationships that enable us currently to be able to make use of the Soil Research Institute of Ghana, whereby we are prototyping our first bag of fertilizer. And they would also be able to soil analyze that for us, thankfully. Economic analysis. Well, to create an incentive for farmers to actually give up their bagasse, which they ban and don't have use for, we're giving them as, paying them a 0 0.068 um, dollar per kilogram of bagasse. And this should allow them to bring it to our structure, which is centralized in each district. Well, our, our revenue as well is $607,000 based on a penetrated pricing approach of $25 as compared to our competitors of 30 $30 per bag currently in Ghana. And our cost structure currently is $30,000 for the structure, but then when we incorporate maintenance, et cetera, that should move up to about $50,000. Yes, so this is my team, and we are an amazing group of computer science students. Um, we have Dr. Elena Roscar, who's in the bioengineering. We've been able to access a lot of the research labs in my school, as well as in the CSIR department of Ghana. And basically, Sabon Sake is just creating biocompost fertilizer using the combined method of vermicomposting and uh, bioinoculated bagasse, which is wasted, and also buffering that app by rescuing food with a web-based technology that allows us to ensure that the 60% of post-harvest loss of sugarcane does, um, does not make the circular economy loosen up, but tighten it further and facilitate that process. So that's what we are and that's what we do. Thank you. As you know, the judges are gonna do a little deliberation and we get, to chat, we get a chance to chat. So you go to a really interesting university. Yes. And this is kind of routine, this sort of problem solving uh, there. Is that true? Yes, exactly. So we make use of, so my, I, I call that Chessy Design Lab 
my second room. So over there, we have the opportunity to design, think, and design, make. And several projects like this have passed through our lab, whereby we use design thinking principles in order to create great problem solution fits mm -hmm. for problems like this that are pertinent and prevalent in our country, Ghana, and various developing economies. And it gives us a lot of incentive and drive as youth to actually implement feasible and viable solutions to it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a fascinating process. We do some work at the Johnson Center with um, nonprofit organizations and community programming and using design thinking to solve you know, community and social issues. Exactly. And it's a fascinating way of working. Um, there was something about um, working at the airport at a cafe. Were you doing some problem solving there? Yes, um, exactly. So I was looking into user experience mm -hmm. um, for the cafe, and I had to employ design thinking principles as well, whereby um, trying to find out the pain points for customers that actually pass through the cafe uh -huh. and see how best we can improve their customer experience. So I had to go through a lot of interviews, discussions, analytical work, and using a lot of analytical frameworks like the Venn diagram, et cetera, in order to come up with a great strategy for the cafe. And that's what I do mainly for other companies that I've worked with. That's fascinating. As as, yeah. And that all really prepped you for this project here. Yes, yes, and that's why I'm so excited because this is an opportunity for us to actually implement this. And that's why we're really grateful for the opportunity to actually get funding for it if possible, in order to make this happen for Ghana. And that framework for entrepreneurialism from the school that you go to is very helpful. Exactly. It's really, really, really excellent. Great. Let's check in on the judges and All see right. how they're doing. All right. You good? I think they're good. All right. Good luck. Thank you. It's my turn. Um, nice job. Thank I you. enjoyed the presentation. Um, it sounds like today that farmers are currently paying zero dollars for fertilizer, for sugar cane. Is that, is that a true? Did I understand that correctly? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Educate me. Yeah, I'd love, I'd love to elaborate on that. Um, so currently there's little or no fertilizer used. So currently Ghana has a fertilizer subsidy program, right? That, another problem. All import, all fertilizer coming to Ghana is 100% imported and inorganic. So what happens is Ghana tries, and it's expensive, so there's little or no use at all, and they try and create, you know, cow dung, things like that to actually improve their crop yield, et cetera, but it's really tough and difficult. So what currently happens is Ghana slashes the price down for them. But the problem also is that the availability and distribution process takes time. And by the time it gets to these farmers who are resource poor and need it, it they would not need it at that point anymore. So they do pay for it. If not, they create, they create their own fertilizer. Okay. That's the problem there. So for your solution, how will yes. you sell that to these farmers that are either avoiding the cost of inorganic fertilizer um, so they would pay for this um, bio-enriched compost um, that you've created? How, how would you sell that to them? Great. So our marketing strategies. And I'm very glad to have um, Emmanuel Osama on board to help us with that. So one marketing strategy we looked at based on our research was targeting commercial farmers. So Ghana has a National Farmer Day, and a lot of farmers are judged the best farmers. So they are in dire need of organic fertilizer that enables them to reach the standard in order to export and actually commercialize and improve their livelihoods. So that's one way we looked at. And currently, we have one farmer who would love to try that. Also, in the Bronga Hapo region of Ghana, what um, farmers are doing, because they cannot wait for distribution to get to them, is they try and create their own organic fertilizer. So there's a desire for it, and there's a willingness to actually employ that process employ that strategy. So it's, um, they're actually keen on it. And we wouldn't have the Tave farmers on board with us as our first customer if they didn't have a desire to actually use fertilizer. Because in order to increase yield and crop yield, and based on our demos with them, and partnership with people like the Giz Ghana Corporation, who have their main focus on just educating farmers about how to use fertilizer and apply it well. I think it's going to make it, or would it work for them. Thank you. I, I have a, a question related to that, and um, 
That is, how much of this have you prototyped, especially the fertilizer component? Yes. And then the, the follow-on question would be, how, how do you scale it? Nice. Thank you. So currently, we have the opportunity to walk through the Social Research Institute and Crop Research Institute of Ghana. What we've done currently with securing 3,750 tons of bagasse is having to actually take strains of the natural living organisms, working with our advisor, our bioengineer, and Joshua, who works at the Soil Research Institute. Currently, we've been able to identify unique strains that can be multiplied and created in a sludge form, either in a liquid or powdered form. And that's what we've been doing currently. And also with the earthworms, which are indigenous to Africans, what we're doing is we've created a really small reclaimed box size whereby we've picked out earthworms already and are monitoring them and creating the system whereby they can be multiplied for use. So at the moment, we're just waiting for summer to officially start and then put all that together and then have the Soil Research Institute to analyze the process and then we can start bagging. Yes. Thank you. That's how far we've reached. And your last question, sorry, about, um, I would love to have that again. With sorry. scale, how do you scale it? How do we scale that? Great. So one of the unique factors about the solution is that we're working with districts and cooperatives. So Tove, South Tongu district is a district, right? So working with the farmers, we, have, we know the number of farmers that are there, what they need. So after we create our centralized um, structure whereby we're creating the compost for them, et cetera, all we need to do is move on to the next region or the next district in need of fertilizer, talk and speak with the cooperative, and then create that system. And that replicates all across board. And that is a lean way of actually starting. And that's what we appreciate. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I was wondering about the, so the financial um, startup costs of, cool. of doing what you're doing. I'm curious of how, what kind of impact this, this money, this grant would give you to get off the ground. Amazing. So with, a, with the grant of Wege, hopefully, would be able to create. So the great part about our project is we can do things in a manual way and also do things in an automated way because we have labor available and skilled labor to make this happen. So with the grant, what we'll do is purchase essential material that will ensure that this quality of, of the fertilizer and our substance. And that is mainly just creating a dome, which was in the slide, a very, um, a, getting a modified shipping container, having a dome in it and then a solar, so solar power on it, as well as reclaimed wood where we put our vermicompost. We have our bagasse in there. We have our earthworms ready. We have our bioinoculated um, fertilizer in liquid or powdered form. We mix them together. We cover that place up, and then we can produce more and more and more. So with the grant, we are able to also soil analyze and test it. Luckily for us, we are able to get it for free for the first time. But with the grant, we would be able to pursue that more in detail and create a very good quality fertilizer that can be used across board and sustain factories across Ghana and beyond. Um, I guess my question is, um, when you brought up the subsidies um, and yes. the, some of that, uh, you know, the government's uh, integral to supplying that to these farmers. How are you going to get them off that, in, in, in essence? And also the cultural aspect of burning trash, yes. I know is, you know, is it, that's a practice. So uh, is there sort of an educational component to this? Are you going to be able to, to, to get out there and say, hey, look, stop burning this stuff. Give us your, um, your, your, ref, your refuse and so that we can use it for the compost. Thank right. you. In the landscape of poverty, 20% of Ghana's GDP comes from agriculture. And Therefore, it makes agriculture a sector which cannot be ignored, overlooked. And in order to improve the lives of these farmers, it's essential that we create an ecosystem that allows, allows them to thrive, which in, and also allows us as citizens to thrive and improves food security. The educational platform, we don't want to handle that. But with partnership with the German corporation Gizgana, that's what they call them, they have a focus on educating farmers and take this upon themselves, regions, um, farming districts that need education and how to you know, use um, fertilizer, create more awareness. We are getting to them and partnering with them in order to come on board with us so that we have more focus on creating our fertilizer and improving it. Um, your last question, sorry. <laughs> 
No, no, that's, that's that was you, it. You, you, yeah, you got yeah. it. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Thanks. So sugarcane is a once a year crop, seasonal. Perennial. Yes. Uh, so you will. Sorry, say it again. Yes, perennial. Okay. So you'll be exceptionally busy at one part of the year, you're collecting in the big ass and then and turning into fertilizer through these processes. So what about the rest of the time? Can, can these practices be transferred to some other crop, for example? Yes, definitely. And that would probably be in our medium and long term goal because our system can work with other agricultural residue or bio waste. And that is the great part about it. So when we don't have sugarcane bagasse readily available, having maize stalks and straws all across board and being burnt again, we can employ that as our carrier base and then use our system to replicate and create excellent fertilizer for them, organic as well. And also, the thing about it is there are four acres, um, averagely 45 acres of farmland for one farmer, right? So they also plant at different times. So in excess, on a daily, they're receiving tons of sugar cane onto their, their land. So bagasse, to some extent, and as much as is a um, sugar cane, and, and, and to some extent, in as much as it's a perennial crop, it's, they're able to still have a lot of sugar cane being produced all year round because they plant at different times and have vast quantities of land across the region. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.